How did a young Cro-Magnon man die in a brutal battle with a cave bear 13,500 years ago? Let's find out. In the silent shadows of the Swiss Jura, inside a limestone cavern overlooking the cold waters of the Dubes River, archaeologists made a breathtaking discovery. It was 1956 when they first unearthed the partial remains of a Stone Age hunter, his skeleton tangled among the bones of a bear, charcoal and flint arrowheads. But it wasn't until now that scientists realized the true significance of what they had found. This was no ordinary burial. This was a frozen moment in time, the final act of a fatal encounter between human and beast, preserved for over 13,500 years. This young man, now known as the Bichon Man, lived during the late Upper Paleolithic period, between 13,770 and 13,560 years ago. His bones, analyzed with the most cutting-edge tools of modern genomics, reveal that he was a member of a group we now call the Western Hunter-Gatherers, a genetic lineage that left a powerful imprint on the people of Europe even today. But the most captivating part of his story is not only in his DNA, it lies in the drama of his death, the mystery of his culture, and the incredible genetic legacy he left behind. The setting is Grotte du Bichon, a karstic cave perched 846 metres above sea level. This cave became the final resting place of a man in his early twenties, standing about 1.64 metres tall and weighing just over 60 kilos, or 5 feet 4 and a half inches and 135 pounds. His physique was wiry, yet muscular, marked by right-handed asymmetry in the skeleton that suggests extensive tool and weapon use. But what he didn't expect was what he would encounter when he tracked a bear into that dark cavern. The bones of a female brown bear were found intermingled with his. Nine flint-tipped arrows lay nearby, and most dramatically, one fragment of flint was embedded in the bear's third cervical vertebra, evidence that the bear had been struck in the neck with an arrow. This wound showed no signs of healing, meaning the bear died shortly after being shot. Charcoal traces indicate a fire was lit inside the cave, likely to smoke out the wounded animal. The most plausible scenario, reconstructed through archaeological and forensic analysis, is that the hunter wounded the bear with arrows and pursued it into its den, attempting to drive it out with fire, but instead of fleeing, the dying bear may have launched a final, desperate counterattack. In that fatal struggle, both bear and hunter died, locked together forever in an Ice Age tragedy. Genetic sequencing of the Bichon man's remains revealed he was a bearer of Y-chromosome haplogroup I2A and mitochondrial haplogroup U5B1H, both lineages associated with Mesolithic hunter-gatherers in Europe. Maternal Y-DNA haplogroup I2A is thought to have originated in Europe before the last glacial maximum and remained highly localized, especially in post-glacial refugia like the Iberian Peninsula and the Balkans. Maternal mitochondrial haplogroup U5, especially U5b, is frequently found among Paleolithic Europeans and is associated with some of the earliest known modern humans on the continent. In the landmark study, titled Upper Paleolithic Genomes Reveal Deep Roots of Modern Eurasians, Bichon Man's high-coverage genome was sequenced to a depth of 9.5x, providing one of the highest quality ancient DNA records for a Paleolithic European. He was classified as a Western hunter-gatherer, a genetic cluster that includes individuals from Spain to Hungary and extending even into Scandinavia. This group is one of three ancestral populations that contributed to the gene pool of modern Europeans. The other two were early European farmers from Anatolia and the light-skinned, fair-haired, brown-eyed Caucasus hunter-gatherers, who later intermixed during the Bronze Age with stepper herders of the Yamnaya culture. The Western hunter-gatherers had survived the last glacial maximum by retreating into southern European refugia, likely Iberia and southern France, and then expanded back into central and northern Europe as the climate warmed. Their distinct genome appears to have undergone little admixture for thousands of years, suggesting a prolonged period of isolation and continuity. This population was characterized by high levels of homozygosity, a sign of small, isolated communities living in harsh Ice Age environments.
In the report, the individual from Grotte du Bichon is described as a skeleton of a young male of Cro-Magnon type. This phrasing is not casual. It reflects an intentional classification that recognizes the morphological and genetic continuity between the Bichon man and the earliest Homo sapiens to settle in Ice Age Europe beginning over 40,000 years ago. The term Cro-Magnon, derived from the 1868 discovery of anatomically modern human remains at the Cro-Magnon rock shelter in southwestern France, historically referred to robust early European Homo sapiens who coexisted, and in many cases interbred, with Neanderthals. Though the term fell out of favour in preference for the more clinical early European modern humans, its use in the report shows a return to the recognition that Cro-Magnon is not only a valid anthropological label, it is a necessary one. It designates a distinct yet foundational population whose genetic and physical traits still echo in today's Europeans. And more importantly, it recognizes their unique identity, shaped by adaptation to Ice Age Europe, robust bone morphology, large cranial capacity, and cultural sophistication. Critics of the term often cite the outdated notion that Cro-Magnons represented a separate evolutionary branch of humans. Some earlier anthropologists proposed they were a superior race or even species. This interpretation has long been discredited. Modern paleoanthropology and genomics, including the very studies in which Bichon Man is referenced, confirm that Cro-Magnons were Homo sapiens in every sense, members of our species and ancestors of many modern populations. The term Cro-Magnon, therefore, does not imply separateness from modern humans. It reflects continuity and Ice Age adaptation. Moreover, the move away from the term Cro-Magnon was driven in part by an ideological resistance to acknowledging the extent of interbreeding between these early modern humans and Neanderthals. Twenty years ago, many scholars still believed in a replacement model of human evolution an idea that modern humans swept across Eurasia and replaced archaic humans with little or no interbreeding. Under this view, there was no room for Cro-Magnons to be both modern and mixed with Neanderthal DNA, but that theory is now defunct. The genome of the Bichon man carries Neanderthal ancestry, roughly 2% of his DNA. This alone invalidates the idea that Cro-Magnons were a distinct and pure species that supplanted Neanderthals without admixture. On the contrary, genomic studies since 2010 have shown that the very first modern humans in Europe, including Cro-Magnons like Bichon, mated with Neanderthals relatively soon after arrival. In fact, the longer stretches of Neanderthal DNA in upper Paleolithic genomes suggest that this interbreeding was fresh and recent. By continuing to refer to Bichon man as a Cro-Magnon type, Jones et al., honor a classification that still has descriptive and scientific utility. It allows paleoanthropologists to distinguish between early Homo sapiens in Europe, who lived in Ice Age conditions, made Aurignacian and Gravettian tools, painted caves and hunted mammoths, and later populations that developed agriculture, lived in sedentary villages, and descended from Anatolian or steppe herders. It anchors these early Europeans in a coherent biological and cultural identity, one that has shaped the genetic landscape of Europe to this day. Those who sought to discard the term Cro-Magnon failed to anticipate the richness of genetic data that would emerge. Their rigid commitment to a non-interbreeding model of speciation between Neanderthals and modern humans not only underestimated the complexity of human evolution, it obscured the very real and measurable legacy of hybridization that defines us. Bichon Man like his Cro-Magnon forebears and contemporaries, including Tagliente Man, who lived around 17,000 years ago in northern Italy, was not an isolated branch. He was part of a braided stream of human history, where early modern humans adapted, interbred, thrived, and laid the foundations of our genetic heritage. Calling him Cro-Magnon is not only scientifically accurate, it is an acknowledgement of who we are. Phenotypically, the Bichon man likely had intermediate skin and blue eyes, like modern Sicilians, in contrast to northern Europeans. This combination, seen in other Mesolithic individuals such as Lebrana from Spain and Lochbourg from Luxembourg, was once common among western hunter-gatherer populations. 
The intermediate skin tone was due to the lack of the derived allele in the SLC24A5 gene, which only later became common with the arrival of Neolithic farmers from the Near East. However, Bichon Man possessed the derived allele of the HERC2 OCA2 complex, associated with lighter eye color, possibly blue or hazel. Stable isotope analysis suggests Bichon Man had a largely carnivorous diet. His nitrogen isotope values are elevated, typical of Ice Age European hunter-gatherers who relied heavily on red meat and freshwater fish. There is no indication of cereal or dairy consumption, which only became common thousands of years later with the Neolithic transition. Archaeologically, Beechan Man is associated with the Azilian culture, a post-Magdalenian hunter-gatherer tradition that emerged after the peak of the last glacial maximum. The Azilian people continued the cave art traditions of their Magdalenian predecessors, but their portable art was less elaborate, often reduced to stylized geometric patterns and painted pebbles. Their toolkit was characterized by microliths and bone harpoons, used for hunting in forested environments that replaced the former steppe tundra as the glaciers receded. Azilian sites span from Spain to Switzerland and southern Germany, and they reflect a cultural shift toward more regional identities and adaptations to warming climates. The presence of Bichon Man in this cultural matrix at the end of the Upper Paleolithic speaks to the resilience of these hunter-gatherers still thriving on the edge of glacial retreat. What makes the Bichon Man such an extraordinary find isn't just the drama of his death or the pristine condition of his bones. It's the combination of cultural, forensic, and genomic data all converging in one site. He is one of the best preserved and best sequenced Upper Paleolithic individuals in all of Europe. His genome has served as a cornerstone for modeling the ancestry of Western Europeans, particularly the deep genetic roots that predate agriculture, writing, and metal. Moreover, the forensic reconstruction of his death paints one of the most vivid personal stories ever unearthed from prehistory. Unlike most burials, which leave us with questions about cause of death, this scene is frozen in clarity. A hunter who pursued a wounded bear into its lair set a fire to drive it out and died in the ensuing struggle. This is not just prehistory. It is a human story. His genome also reminds us that the Western hunter-gatherers were not a fringe population. They were strong, enduring, and foundational to what we now call European. Their DNA survives in all modern Europeans, particularly in the North and West. In fact, the Western hunter-gatherer contribution is particularly high in populations such as the Basques and Scandinavians. This genetic endurance suggests not just survival, but assimilation. When farmers from Anatolia and herders from the steppe arrived, they did not erase the Western hunter-gatherer. They merged with them, shaped by generations of contact and marriage. The Bichon man died a violent and intimate death. But in doing so, he entered the record of human history as one of its most compelling figures. His struggle with a bear is a snapshot of Ice Age life, of bravery, hunger, desperation and danger. Yet his DNA tells a far larger story, the shaping of the modern European genome from the fusion of Paleolithic survivors and later waves of migration. Grotte du Bichon, that quiet cave above the Doubs River, has given us more than bones. It has given us a name, a face, and a story. In this young man's tragic death, we gain insight into the resilience, isolation, and ingenuity of the last true hunters of Ice Age Europe. And in his DNA, we glimpse ourselves. 